Welcome everyone to today's uh, Law After Lunch uh, lecture. Um, this is our uh, fourth lecture during this uh, summer term. And we have uh, a great variety of different presentations uh, this semester, ranging from uh, the future of NATO to kind of the political situation in Turkey, um, um, or like uh, the, the recent decision of the European Court of Justice um, uh, on the Singapore um, agreement. Um, we are kind of, um, at its core, uh, law after lunch is focused on uh, issues of international economic law, but we are also, um, uh, while this is the core, we have a much broader conception and we are particularly glad about the, the cooperation that we have with the Max Planck Institute uh, in Halle, uh, which is one of the finest research institutions uh, on law and anthropology in, uh, in Europe. Today, uh, our uh, guest speak uh, speaker is uh, Catherine LaRouche. Uh, she's a, um, a PhD student at the McGill University in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, she's speaking today about her PhD uh, topic which deals with um, the politics of Islamic um, charitable action in North India. So kind of uh, has to do deals with how um, NG uh, Muslim NGOs address the marginalization of the Muslim um, religious minority in India and thereby also addresses um, issues of how they tangle with different uh, normative orders, the legal regulation in India, but also the religious uh, normative order. Um, yeah, we're excited uh, about your talk. You have, um, uh, take your time, you have uh, 40, 45 minutes, but uh, it would be great if we have uh, some time also for uh, discussion. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, everyone for coming uh, to this presentation and uh, I would uh, first like to uh, thank the department uh, here and Mr. Lang and also Professor uh, Titi and Professor Hanschel, unfortunately they couldn't be here, um, for giving me the opportunity to present um, here at the Law After Lunch series. Um, thank you Vincent for the organization and also thank you to the Max Planck Institute uh, because they are hosting me um, now to finish uh, my um, doctoral dissertation and they're providing a very stimulating environment to, talk, uh, to think about anthropology and, and uh, law. So my presentation um, today will look at the regulation of charitable activities in India and its effect on the way Muslim NGOs operate and reshape Islamic arms giving rules and norms. Um, so I will first start with a little example. Um, how do I put my... Uh, oh yeah. Just the next slide and then you should... Ah, voila. So that's the beginning of my uh, PowerPoint. So um, I will first uh, uh, start with a little ethnographic example to introduce you to uh, my topic. So one day, a Muslim cleric that I will call here Molana Imran Kasmi came to see me to ask me if I could get someone to translate his NGO constitution and registration certificate from English to Hindi because he didn't speak uh, English and the NGO constitution was in English so he wanted translation. Molana Imran Kasmi was very active in the local Muslim community and wanted to use his influence among the youth to mobilize them to do something for the education of poor Muslims given that there are more and more evidence um, indicating that Muslims form a disproportionate part of India's most socially and economically marginalized citizen at the moment. Uh, Molana Imran Kasmi, however, felt that nothing could be done uh, before first getting a formal NGO registration. So he does borrow an NGO constitution and the bylaws from a Muslim businessman uh, that he knew that had founded himself an NGO. Um, and then he gathered the names of the seven people required to form the NGO executive uh, committee and officially registered uh, his new NGO under the National Societies Registration Act. Once this was done, he came to see me because he was anxious to know what were the rules and obligations he now had to comply with. So first, um, and here I have reproduced a part of the constitution of the NGO. First, he wanted to make sure that the aims and objectives stated in the NGO constitution were progressive enough. So he wanted, his goal was to change social, to bring social change in the community and by focusing on education and not to do simple almsgiving like Muslims generally do when they give their religious donation. 
Um, second, he wanted to confirm with me whether the document clearly stated that his NGO was going to be secular. And by secular here, he doesn't mean that it was going to be non-religious, but more that it was going to be not only for Muslim and uh, that it would ha be nationalist. Um, so the aims and goals listed in the Constitution specified that the work of the NGO would be for the benefit of all citizens, Indian citizens, that the work would be based on a secular approach, and that the aim was to spread education, promote vocational training, and modern development in science and technology for the youth. So the aims and goals of this Constitution reassured uh, Molana Imran Kasmi as they reflected exactly what he was um, uh, wanted uh, through an NGO registration. So I am presenting this small example because it stresses the importance of NGO regula regulatory frameworks and the ways in which they structure the field of charitable action. So for Molana Imran Kasmi, setting up a formal state-regulated NGO manifests certain ideas about the concepts of, so of social welfare and about how to help others. So in this presentation, beyond the formal uh, act of getting uh, NGO registration, I attend to the symbolic and practical uh, implication that the uh, of the institutionalization of Islamic charity. And here when I talk about institutionalization of, of charity, I mean the organization of Islamic charity uh, into a formal NGO institutional structure and the whole process of professionalization that goes with it and the adoption of norms and practices that emerge in part from the regulation governing uh, the structures, aims and functioning of NGOs. So I have two goals in this presentation. First, um, I will show how the regulation of charitable activities in India, which are based on principles of secularism, have uh, tended to separate the realms of secular uh, and religious forms of charity and welfare. Um, but Muslim NGOs, however, they blur these kinds of legal boundaries and they are able to combine and navigate different normative orders namely uh, state laws governing NGOs and the rule and customs of Islamic almsgiving. So, and second, what I want to show is that by becoming a formal NGO, it has symbolic uh, meanings that exceed what the regulatory framework for NGO actually um, dictates. And this creates for uh, the Muslim charity workers both interesting possibilities for tra transforming the way social welfare is practiced, uh, but it also brings a set of ethical dilemmas. So in other words, what I will show here is that successive regulation of charity and welfare have constructed a specific uh, conception of charity that emphasizes efficiency, systematism, and professional modes of uh, doing welfare. And this has incited Muslim organization to modernize their welfare uh, practices and transform certain aspects of Islamic on-giving rules to fit a professional model of welfare. Um, and this conciliation of in NGO institutional regulation and norms uh, with the rules of Islamic almsgiving has provided a space for Muslim volunteers to uh, fulfill certain aspirations for social change, but the expectations created by this new way of practicing charity raises also a number of challenges that I will um, show a little bit later in this, uh, in this talk. And I believe that although analyzing the, regular, uh, the regulation of charity might be a very specific topic and, uh, and looking at the micropolitics of charitable work, um, but it matters because we are in a glo global context where states are increasingly um, devolving responsibility for social welfare on non-state civil society uh, institutions and in individuals themselves. And, but at the same time, they're heavily um, uh, determining through the regulation of NGO work, what organized look like and can do. So NGO are given a larger role in the provision of social welfare, but they are also expected to comply um, and perform in a certain way. So, um, and one of the best examples to illustrate this um, this situation is uh, the major cut in foreign contribution uh, certificates that the government of India, the new government, uh, Narendra Modi, as soon as he came into power, one of the first things he did was to cut uh, foreign contribution certificates of NGOs for a variety of reasons, those who didn't file their annual uh, tax reports, but also for NGOs that were deemed to be, uh, to have anti-national activities. So there's always like this strong idea that you can regulate the, the field of NGOs. 
struggles. Or we can talk, think uh, more related to uh, Muslim organization in the US, for example. Muslim charity have to put more efforts in following accountability standards than other type of organization because of increased scrutiny uh, towards them as part of this uh, war on terror. Um, so, and this new uh, modes of uh, governmentality uh, makes it important to look at the NGO form and what it enables and limits and uh, in terms of actual practices of welfare. Um, so first I will give some background on uh, Islamic charity in India because it might uh, not be uh, something that uh, is known by a lot of people and then I'll show a little bit how NGOs and religious charity is regulated in India and I will follow with some uh, ethnographic examples, uh, very um, uh, detailed practice uh, examples of how uh, uh, Muslim charitable workers actually uh, uh, combine different kinds of normative order in their everyday practices. Um, and the work I'm presenting here is, uh, as uh, Mr. Lang said, uh, partly based on my doctoral research that I conducted in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, so in the, the city of Lucknow and in Muzaffarnagar. Uh, between 2013 and 2015, I did uh, 16 months of uh, field work. So, in, uh, so just to talk a little bit about what is Islamic charity uh, in India. Uh, so as in many other Muslim contexts throughout the world, organized Islamic charity mostly talk, took the form first of the waqf. So up to uh, the early 20th century, you had the, the waqf as a system of Islamic charity. So waqf are Muslim land endowments. Um, that have usually been donated uh, for a charitable purpose or a religious purpose, such as the construction and maintenance of shrine, mosques, or building of educational institutions and hospitals. Uh, so for example, here, here you see a Shia Waqf uh, that is now a historical monument, and it was initially built as a place of commemoration for um, the, the Muharram uh, for the Shias. Um, in Lucknow, these walks were mostly established through donation uh, coming from very noble and uh, wealthy families and some of them were directly uh, part of a familial property. So the concept of walk was uh, mixing uh, the idea of uh, private welfare, public welfare, familial uh, uh, forms of charity and mixing also a religious purpose and charitable purpose. So it was uh, mostly a combination of different kinds of modes of thinking about uh, aid to the other. Waqf institutions now uh, do not play as much of a significant role in charity sector in India anymore because uh, despite the fact that they are inalienable, uh, a lot of them have been seized and encroached and there's a lot of controversy about their mismanagement also. And so there's not, uh, a lot of Muslims do, do not have a lot of hopes about uh, the Waqf system to improve the socio-economic conditions of Muslims in the city. A second form of Islamic uh, charity has been structured around the giving of zakat and sadqa. So zakat is one of the five uh, pillars of Islam and it is an obligatory alms in Islam. So uh, it corresponds to a specific proportion of one's wealth that Muslims are required to give to those in uh, need each year. So it's a, it's a religious duty. And sadqa is also a religious donation, but uh, it's an optional donation. So that can be uh, given in addition to prescribed zakat. So there's less rules and regulation around uh, the donation of sadqa. Um, and zakat donation in North India. Uh, are often given, given to madrasas, so the Muslim religious schools, which use these funds to provide free education, food and boarding to uh, poor students. Um, the other common way of giving out zakat is uh, to give it directly to the poor people. And this is best done uh, according to um, and the Quran and the Hadith uh, in secret, so to avoid, avoid taking pride in uh, the act of giving and uh, prior priority should be given to those who are close to the person who donates. So you give to the extended family first, then to uh, the neighbors and then to, uh, to you continue like that, you extend the circles. Um, but for many Muslims uh, in the city where I was, these practices also were not necessarily conducive to bringing tangible social change in the community. So, for example, the number of madrasas in uh, 
in India is increasing, but it's, it remains like a very marginal uh, uh, thing because only approximately 7% of Muslim attend madrasa education, so Muslim religious school uh, education. And uh, so they don't necessarily, it's not all Muslim who thinks that it is necessarily like the best source of uh, social welfare. And while informal personal donations, so the personal donation that you do are one of the most common uh, way of giving out zakat, many wish for something that would be more organized and efficient. So more recently, the third actor has emerged in the field of Islamic charity, which is these Muslim NGOs. Um, and Muslim NGOs have started emerging in the 60s and 70s throughout the world at the same time as, uh, as all the, the, the expansion of the NGO sector. And in India, they were created, most of the Muslim NGOs were created um, after the 1990s, where India had a politics of economic liberalization, which created a, a new wave of expansion and consolidation of the NGO sector. So these new Islamic organizations are increasingly able to secure a part of the zakat and sadqa donation. And for many Muslims, they are now perceived as a new uh, positive avenue for helping the poorest uh, in the country. So uh, now I will look uh, quickly at the regulation of charitable action in India. Um, and for that, I mostly take inspiration on the work of uh, Erika Bornstein on law and religious giving and Ritu Birla's work on colonial rule of law governing uh, market practices in India. So, to the, so before talking about these laws regulating charity, I have to give a few uh, notes on Indian secularism. So the Indian constitution promotes secularism through the principles of state neutrality towards all religion and the freedom to profess, practice and prop propagate one's own religion. So more specifically in the Indian case, this means that the state cannot promote a specific religion, so for example through mandatory education, uh, and that religious groups maintain a high uh, religious and cultural autonomy. So concretely this means that religious groups are actually governed by their own uh, distinctive religious personal laws uh, for all questions of marriage, divorce, adoption, succession, inheritance, and uh, so, so you have Muslim personal law, Hindu law, instead of having, for example, a uniform civil code. And then uh, they also have the right to establish and manage their own religious institutions, like such as this one, and uh, to manage their own educational institutions. Uh, in practice, however, like colonial and post-colonial authorities have been always involved in codifying, regulating, administrating, and also funding religious institutions. Um, for example, early British colonial rulers favored this approach of non-interference with Indian customs, religion, and tradition um, because they, they believed that in, uh, Indian religion and culture had more importance for Indian than it had for Europeans who were more inclined to rationality and modernity. Um, but uh, for, uh, in order to uh, apply this policy of non-interference, uh, it meant that they had to define what actually belongs to the domain of religion and what has to, belongs to the, dom the domain of secularism. So it's under uh, British colonial rules that they compile different texts to, uh, to uh, standardize and codify Muslim personal law and Hindu law. So, uh, as scholars working on secularism, uh, such as uh, Talal Assad and Sabah Mahmoud, for example, uh, pointed out secularism and uh, secularism uh, in general, not just in the Indian context, is more than a separation of religion and the state. It can be understood as a redefinition of what counts as religious, what counts as secular, and how religion is supposed to enter the public sphere. Uh, so we see the same thing happening, the same process in the domain of uh, welfare and charity. So successive regulation of charity have slowly defined the field of uh, charitable action, of a secular form of charitable action, and what is divided, uh, w uh, what religious charity is. And this has a profound implication on the way char religious charity is practiced now. So by the late uh, 19th century, uh, and the beginning of the 20th century, the government of India passed a series of laws for the regulation and control of charitable activities. So many of these laws establish boundaries between modern charity based on the idea of a formal contractual relation between donors and beneficiaries and um, a boundary with customary religious tradition of giving which were based in their idea on caste relation, community ties, religious ties. 
So in 1860, for example, the government of India passed the Societies of Registration Act to promote modern forms of civic association uh, in which a charity was uh, standardized as an endeavor on the behalf of a general public. Um, the Charitable uh, Endowment Act that we see here in, uh, in 1890 um, also defined a charitable purpose as benefiting an abstract anonymous public. Um, so we see here, for example, it's written uh, any other object of general public utility, which really, and it cannot be uh, exclusively for religious teaching or worship. Um, so this, in a sense, disqualified all these walk I was talking about because they're mixing familial uh, welfare, private welfare, and public charitable purposes. So they could not be protected and recognized as charitable organizations. Uh, furthermore, the Charitable and Religious Trust Act in 1920 also identified religious trusts that were for the public good and distinguished them from private familial religious institutions. Um, and so for Ritu Birla, she argues that these successive legislative measures were a colonial effort to replace forms of relation that were caste-based, religious-based, community-based, and seen as, as less advanced. Uh, and they were, it's, it was a way to replace that by a form of a modernist narrative of a scientific philanthropy, something that is based on liberal values. Um, and so these laws were also a way of, of exerting a greater uh, control on the population uh, by displacing these kinds of caste-based, community-based relations. Um, and after Indian uh, independence in 1947, some additional laws further defined the field of charitable activity. Uh, so notably in the 1960s, uh, the Income Tax Act uh, further defined this providing tax deduction for donors giving to specifically approved organization. So charitable organization can, uh, can now apply to, uh, to, uh, for a certificate of approval that they commonly call between themselves the ATG certificate. In the, uh, for, uh, and the donors giving to these organizations will receive a tax deduction for their uh, donation. So to obtain the certificate, uh, again, the Income Tax Act specified that organizations um, have to work uh, for a general public and not a specific community. And it also specified that, uh, yes, so, so you cannot be working for the benefit of a specific caste or community and you won't be granted an APG certificate in that context. Uh, there's many uh, exceptions to that, but uh, if we, uh, I would get into too much details. There are some religious organizations that can obtain it. Um, so, these various laws uh, have uh, considerably shaped the field of charitable action uh, because religious institutions that are such as shrines, temples, uh, are tax exempt, but donors giving to these institutions are generally not entitled to tax deductions. Um, and uh, so, a large proportion of individual donations given to temples, mosques, madrasas, are thus not really regulated by the, the state and form some kind of autonomous field. On the other side, NGOs are considered a as charitable organization and thus have to comply to uh, several different national and re regional regulation and with all the process uh, and culture of audit and accountability that is involved with it. And on that, uh, I will come back a little bit on on the symbolic aspect of, uh, of this whole process of audit culture that uh, Marilyn Stratton, for example, Sally and Gil Mary in uh, anthropology have discussed a lot. So the Muslim charitable organization that I follow, they get registered under these same laws, uh, mainly the Society's Registration Act, which places them... Oops. No. Can you switch? Working now. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, w the, the, the fact that Muslim charitable organizations are registered under the, the same laws, the, it places them legally on the same grounds as any kind of secular NGOs. So, most of the organizations also uh, comply to all the criteria to obtain the ATG certificate. 
So here you see, for example, a website of an organization that says you can give your zakat, your sadqa, your bank interest, and you will get a tax deduction for it as per the rules of APG uh, Income Tax Act. So um, from the arms that were better given in secret that I explained, now I want to focus uh, on some of the symbolic meanings that this regulation of non-profit organization had for Muslim charitable workers seeking an NGO status because as I say these rules come with a whole uh, a certain culture and uh, certain practices that are involved with them that exceed uh, the regulation in itself. So registration for the NGOs that I met uh, first carried this uh, idea of doing a different kind of Islamic charity. So they, by getting registered, um, they, they believed that it would uh, create a more organized and professional form of uh, Islamic charity focused on long-term alleviation of needs and a form of charity that is uh, focused on economic efficiency, the production of results and evidence base, and so very different from this uh, act of giving out zakat in a personal way. So for many um, organization founders I met, the process of institutionalization was a way of concretizing their aspiration for uh, using religious donation in a more productive way. Um, and this is also confirmed by many studies uh, on Islamic charity in other contexts and also by uh, Christopher Taylor's study in my own uh, uh, area. And so this is exactly what motivated uh, Molana Imran Kasmi, the example that I gave in the beginning of my talk, uh, for creating an NGO because he believed that the, the whole idea of registering as a, 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 an NGO would, uh, would, help him to bring, uh, would help him to bring these tangible social ch change in the community where informal donation practices had uh, more or less failed to do so. Um, and registration uh, was also perceived by some as an additional form of uh, moral legitimacy. Because when they start uh, collecting almsgiving for uh, the activities of the NGO, the charitable workers to a certain extent become involved in a relation that normally unites Muslim donors, recipients uh, and God. Um, and uh, so the institutionalization of charity in the NGO form comes with enormous responsibility and pressures for accountability and the organization op opened themselves to uh, enormous suspicion and scrutiny. And for most of the charitable workers I met, um, the religious na nature of the organization was not seen as sufficient in itself to ensure transparency, accountability, and a rightful util uh, utiliza utilization of donation. So, for example, um, since uh, uh, Islam is based on multiple source of religious authority. People are sometimes openly doubtful of religious leaders. And uh, so religious leaders can be self-proclaimed. And so for many charitable workers, they thought, well, uh, it's not because you have a religious leader heading an NGO that it means that the NGO will be transparent and not corrupted. They can also as well um, be corrupted. And so having uh, the state regulation is an extra form of uh, ensuring transparency and accountability. And for example, Tahir, an import-export business owner who belonged to one of the most influent family of religious scholars in India and who also founded an NGO, uh, argued that because workers uh, in charitable organizations work for the sake of afterlife, they do not necessarily care about the actual earthly effects of charitable work. And so he said, the other non-Muslim charity work for the cre creation and we work for the creator. When the word goes towards you know an unseen creator, where you know whether you deliver or not, really the result will come in after you die. But till I'm alive, there's no accountability. So there are those who would dare, you know, just as you would miss prayers, just as you miss other Islamic rulings. In a similar way, if you would misuse the zakat, at least in this living, in this life, there is no accountability. So for him, although this is not a view that was shared by a lot of, uh, of uh, charitable workers, um, the idea that you work for, for the afterlife was uh, an, uh, a reason why you needed also state regulation to ensure a higher uh, form of accountability. Uh, this doesn't mean that Muslim uh, NGO workers thought that secular NGO were very transparent and all that, like everyone in the NGO world is accusing each other of corruption, but it's more the idea that by combining religious um, rules of giving and state regulation, you have an additional possibility of being accountable and transparent. Um, so, um, 
So as I said, so this, uh, the whole registration process is much more than simp uh, simple regulation. It symbolizes aspiration for a more efficient mode of doing charity, as I explained. And this formal NGO structure also provides a source of legitimacy that, is addition, uh, that comes in addition to religious principles. But um, this whole process also creates pressure on organization uh, to conciliate different normative orders in their everyday practice once they seek um, this official uh, NGO status. So now what I want to do is look at this, uh, how this uh, professionalization and new expectation for accountability and transparency, uh, transparency influences actual Islamic almsgiving practices in organization. So for this, I will give uh, some examples of the daily donation uh, decision process in one organization that I followed, uh, Community Trust. I cannot unfortunately show photos of the distribution process because there was a lot of uh, uh, women uh, coming at the institution that didn't want uh, photos to be publicly displayed. Uh, but this is, a, this is a, an image of the area where the institution was located. Um, and so I will show here how um, their daily donation practice transformed considerably two dimensions of Islamic rules of uh, almsgiving, uh, principally the, the idea of who you give donation to and uh, the, the criteria that you use uh, to give donations. So uh, just to give a little bit of background, the Community Trust was a small uh, Sunni uh, organization founded in the mid-90s uh, by a group of highly uh, educated elite class retired Muslim women and they had a lot of connection with the Muslim religious organization in the area and most of their funding were based on zakat and sadqa, as I explained, so they were re uh, receiving these uh, religious donations and mostly from uh, relatives that lived in the UK uh, so, so they had to have the, the to comply to the foreign contribution uh, regulation um, to get these donations. Uh, so it's a, it's an example of a typical uh, Islamic charity uh, uh, how it functions. Uh, the, the, the example that I'm presenting. Um, so this organization consciously tried to follow uh, expectation of uh, NGO regulations and also Islamic rules of uh, alms giving. So as many registered organizations, the organization tried to uh, stress its secular dimension and concern for the general public. So uh, they did that by stressing that if they uh, work mostly for Muslim, it's not out of religious principle, but out of economic necessity because Muslim are the most discriminated in India. So it was a way of justifying the fact that uh, they are not working only exclusively for Muslims. Uh, and, and have like this public charitable purpose. Um, and then similar to uh, most organizations that collect zakat and sadka fund, they still uh, were able to respect the rules of zakat distribution. So they were focusing on two of the eight categories that are stated uh, as a rule in the Quran for uh, zakat distribution. So uh, the poor and the needy. And so that generally consists of uh, orphans, widows, elderly, disabled and sick people. And, but at the same time, while respecting rules uh, of giving to this category of poor and needy, they were also trying to develop an approach based on long-term intervention, uh, economic efficiency, uh, um, evidence-based. For example, by uh, giving donation to poor and needy, but donation that would uh, be like income-generating activity. So for example, here you have a donation of a a three-wheeler card because uh, the person will be able to sell vegetables and start an income and not uh, rely on charity anymore. So they are really combining these uh, two ideas of, uh, of the NGO mode of doing welfare and uh, Islamic charitable uh, practice. Um, and so one of the main activities of this organization was to uh, have an, a medical clinic where people would come and they would also distribute donations uh, at the clinic and uh, to distribute donations they would hear uh, the cases of each people coming at the clinic um, to, uh, to decide who uh, to help. And in order to follow rules of accountability, transparency and efficiency in handling uh, religious donation, Community Trust developed many measure, measures to systemize and control its distribution process. So that includes keeping a record of all donations received and distributed, producing donation tax uh, receipts, uh, making annual reports publicly available to everyone. And uh, Community Trust also decided to adopt uh, a slum area. 
so that they could uh, proceed to regular checkups, uh, assess, assess the needs by themselves of people, and make sure that the money went to the right person, to a genuine poor. And as many other Muslim organizations, uh, Community Trust started a witness system uh, so that they could verify that the people coming were actually genuine poor. Um, and so being sure that donation went to the prescribed zakat category of the poor and the needy became of utmost importance for organization, uh, even though in uh, Islamic jurisprudence you have different understanding of this. Uh, because in most cases, uh, religious scholars will say that it's, it's the intention of the person that matters and it's better to give zakat than not to give it. So even if you give it, give it to someone who actually did not, uh, was not uh, the poorest of the poorest, if you had the intention to give it and you thought it was uh, the right intention, then it was fine. But in a case like that, the, the instance, uh, there was a real strong insistence on finding a genuine poor. And I argue that it comes uh, in part from this institutionalization of Islamic charity because there is a lot of importance putting, uh, put on the donor's expectation, on the idea of spending transparently as a form of integrity. Um, so for example, in a, in a meeting of an organization, the leader of the organization was speaking to the members and saying Ramzan, so Ramadan, uh, uh, is coming and we will all have to give our zakat. Do not give your zakat to anyone you see in the streets. Give it to people you know in your neighborhood first, otherwise keep it preciously and we, the organization, will tell you who you can give it to. We will make sure that the zakat goes to different people in, the, in different areas. You should look, also look out for who really deserves zakat. Um, the other way that principles of Islamic charity were adapted and reshaped through this um, uh, practice of Islamic charity in an NGO structure was to an excessive attention to the moral worth uh, of the beneficiaries. So zakat in the Quran is understood as the right of the poor and uh, it's based on the, this notion that wealth belongs to God and so it is more or less in condition of, uh, uh, for the poor to receive it. However, in uh, everyday donation practices of these organizations, the decision to provide uh, uh, money to someone coming at the institution was really based on the person's moral worth. So for example, um, Tahira, the organization coordinator, would prioritize cases uh, where the person, the poor person coming, was able to present uh, itself as a good Muslim. So on several occasions, for example, someone would come to request a sewing machine to start a small business and they would be accompanied by a trusted witness uh, that could attest that the person did not consume alcohol, did not smoke, read the Quran, kept the fast, and, and thus would not resell the machine because it's a good Muslim. So the moral conduct of the poor became a way to practice this efficient form of charity by ensuring that the gift would be properly spent. Um, so in another example of this uh, moral conduct and moral worth of the poor, uh, one morning, a young woman entered the clinic and went to stand in the line to get free medical services. And uh, she was very, wearing a very clean burqa uh, that seemed very new and which had very delicate embroideries and pearls woven on their sleeves. So when her turn came to be registered to, for free medical service, Tahira, the coordinator of the organization, stopped her and asked, do you know where the money of the medicine distributed comes from? And the woman had no idea. So she shook her head and the director replied, this is zakat money. Do you think you should receive zakat money? Uh, the woman was a little bit puzzled and did not know what to respond. So the director then ordered her to leave the, uh, the organization and told her that obviously um, she did not look like she uh, deserves zakat because her work was uh, too nice and too fancy compared to all the other women who were keep coming at the center. So in this example, what we see is that community trust would only provide funding if the person presents itself as virtuous and guarantees a good use of the donation. And the woman wearing a nice uh, embroidered burqa just simply did not fit this model of what a genuine and worthy poor should look like. So this whole focus on the moral conduct of the poor and its genuineness is not just a consequence of this uh, culture of accountability, transparency, and efficiency that comes uh, through the institutionalization and the regulation of charitable action uh, 
It's something that is it's also debated among religious scholars and many individual donors also uh, did the same thing, looking for genuine pores. But in general, however, if we look at studies on uh, zakat donation practices, uh, for example, uh, Christopher Taylor's study, he shows that this, this whole idea of tracking donation um, and how donation is used was a very un uncomfortable thought for a lot of Muslims giving out their zakat. So it's really something that is also very much associated to the culture of NGO. So what I argue here is that um, this, it's the regulation of charitable action that increased this attention on the quality of the beneficiary. Uh, many felt that zakat donated to someone unworthy would affect the donor. And uh, so with organized charity, the NGO worker um, take the responsibility in the, uh, of the donor to give it to someone worthy. Um, and now I just want to end my talk by giving a few examples where the organization uh, workers reflected on how uh, this form of professionalization had diverted uh, actually Islamic uh, charitable uh, uh, practices and um, where they were reflecting on actually the very difficult and the challenges of conciliating different normative orders. So the example I want to give is a woman who came um, at the, uh, at the community trust uh, and she was in the terminal stages of her tuberculosis. Oh, this is another example of a medical camp. Um, so the woman was in the terminal stages of her tuberculosis, so she had basically one or two months left uh, to live. And uh, she was very well known by the organization. She was a widow, mother of three, a devout Muslim. And uh, she, she came to the institution to ask money for her hospitalization, uh, knowing that she was going to die. The institution had almost ended its budget reserved to medical aid. And since they were trying to, uh, to keep uh, very strict uh, 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 records of their donation, they were a little bit reluctant to help her. So the leader of the organization did not really want to make the decision. Um, she asked other people in the institution. No one wanted to make the decision. But at the end, she decided to send back the, money, the woman without paying for the hospitalization because she said that the woman would die anyways and that the money would not be properly spent. Um, later that day, of course, that was a shocking interaction. And uh, the, the director and the staff member reflected on this, uh, this choice that they made and they were pre preoccupied that uh, this attempt to be professional, uh, professional and systematic in donation practices had diverted them from the sacred rules of giving. Um, at another moment, also, one of the founders of the organization told me that looking at the moral worth of the people coming at the organization was uh, diverting the principles of Islamic giving because she said poor cannot, uh, you cannot ask poor people to do their prayers with an empty stomach. And finally, the treasurer of the organization revealed that she was actually never, never uh, keeping a record of the donation that she made herself to the organization, because she said that despite uh, the fact that the organization promotes this form of efficient charity, uh, almsgiving are supposed to be given in secret in Islam, and that by recording everything, organizations were simply showcasing their actions and promoting a calculative logic where everyone knows how much one gives and to whom, and uh, 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 there's a public display of this uh, charitable process. So to conclude, um, what I have tried to show here is that the institutionalization and regulation of charity has a significant impact on the context and ways in which religious charity is undertaken. And although the laws governing charity in India have tended to separate the realms of religious and secular charity, what we see with these Muslim NGOs is that they force us to rethink these legal distinctions. Religious charity in the context of India has actually adopted a public, uh, modern, secular mod model of charity that is uh, distinct from these private traditional forms of religious giving. While many see uh, religious charity and secular forms of welfare as incompatible and different, uh, I show here that both are, rela are rather related and influence each other and that Muslim organizations actually combine and adapt different forms of normative orders. 
And um, I show also that uh, while NGO regulations for a lot of people might seem like a mere legal and administrative formality, it also vehiculates a distinct culture of uh, self-monitoring, accountability, good practice and efficiency. And uh, that, that shapes considerably the way uh, organizations do their work. And uh, contrary to significant part of scholarship on NGO that considers this as depoliticizing social action or as a form of state control that constrains, constrains the aims of, uh, uh, of the groups and activists uh, that form NGOs, I suggest a more uh, nuanced view. So organization that I met, uh, for them this, uh, this NGO culture uh, opened a space of possibility. It provided first an additional form of legitimacy to the practices of Islamic charity. It uh, enabled them to become uh, legitimate participants in the field of general public welfare. And uh, it also became a, a means to transform the way Islamic charity uh, is done to promote uh, forms of social improvement, long-term development and change. At the same time, however, the institutionalization of charity leads to a calculative logic, a rational choice approach, um, and forms of exclusion, like in the case of the woman uh, the dying of tuberculosis that was not funded, um, and a focus on efficiency and performance that raise many ethical dilemmas for charitable workers on how to maintain the sacred dimension and principles of aid in such forms of uh, structures. So, um, and a large part, I think, of what I say here concerns Islamic charitable organization, but it also relates to the concept of NGO at large and in a context where uh, the role of NGO is uh, increasing, I think uh, it's important more attention should be given to the possibilities and constraints created by the institutional and legal form that uh, the NGO represents.